Yeah, I, I basically need a foot pedal that makes a servo push a hot dog against the touch screen. <laughs> like, or a conductive probe touching the screen at the press of a foot pedal. Hello and welcome to the Open Hardware Manufacturing Podcast, a podcast about making open source hardware. I'm Lucian Shapar. And I'm Stephen Hawes. And today we're going to be talking about manufacturing automation equipment. So yeah, in this one we talk about what is worth spending money or time on for automating a task specifically in manufacturing. Sometimes things are tedious, they're time consuming, accident prone, and there can be a lot of merit to automating something. If you can have buy a robot, build a robot, or process of some kind to automate it, it can be great. There's, of course, limits to it, and like sometimes we want to build a thing because it sounds fun, but it actually doesn't really make sense to do it. And like, how do you make that decision of we actually truly do need this? We get a little bit meta because <laughs> the Lumen is an automation tool we use, yep. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny. Also, like, there are some approaches to making some of these jigs that kind of in line with like, oh, it'd be fun to solve a really cool, hard engineering problem where, no, two pieces of laser cut acrylic will solve this problem. You don't need to big brain this. You don't need to get nerd sniped. What's the best way to be pragmatic about solving the problem? And how sometimes the absolute best piece of manufacturing equipment is a hot dog hot glued to a servo. <laughs> and how that might be something that we make <laughs> because we need it here. <laughs> yeah, you never know what could happen. You never know what might be useful. Hopefully you guys part the knowledge here. Yep. Let's yeah. get into it. Let's do it. As we turn into this episode on automation equipment, I think you want to explain your favorite XKCD of all time. Yes. So there is an XKCD. It's XKCD 1205. I literally have this printed out and I have it attached to the side of my filing cabinet. It is about when do you decide to automate a task? Sure. It's a, it's a uh, graph or it's like a, a chart that on one axis is like, how often do you do the task? And then the other axis is how long does the task take? And then the cell where those two axes intersect tells you how much time you can spend automating it before you've spent more time automating it than it takes to do it. And there's a missing variable here, which is over what period of time? Because over infinity, everything is worth automating <laughs> as long as it <laughs> takes a finite amount of time to do it. So I think it's like over three years or something. I literally reference this probably. I literally bring it up and look at it for context once a month. Yeah. And I have it printed out on the side of my file. It's so good. And the whole thesis is, I think especially Lucian for you and me, we, we like to build stuff and we see a problem and we're like, Ooh, problem. I could build a thing to solve that. And sometimes you shouldn't. And the pull to do that is like the nerd snipe. Also an XKCD is it, it, like, you shouldn't spend that time. Right. You shouldn't spend the time to do that. You should just do it manually. Cause it's going to be way more automation. The thing you're trying to automate changes too often. It's more of a tool than or it's more of a project than a tool. So I, th that's kind of like the context I think about automation equipment and automating really anything right. throughout the course of like everything we do here. Yeah. So it's, it's a very pragmatic view of like just saving time. Yeah. I yeah. think to me, it's a, it's a little bit beyond this two dimensional chart. Like yeah. is, would automation reduce mistakes? Would it improve quality? Yes. Would it improve like joy? <laughs> exactly. Like there's a, I, saw, I think it was a tweet or something, but like humans in their heads have little electric meatballs. And it's not a computer. It's not deterministic. Humans are uh, error. Like, it's just <laughs> how we are. You, yeah. you can't help but do it. And robots are way more constrained in what they can do, but they're way less likely to make that same kind of mistake. Exactly. So that's also, a, that's another variable here of like, what's the value in having it be done perfectly computationally every time? Yeah. Also, and also just frustration value. Like, maybe it doesn't make sense, but, you know, one of our techs is building a thing that they hate. Yeah. And maybe it takes a lot of time to automate, but if they're like, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to do that anymore. That's also a win. So there's, there's other variables. Like this is definitely a pretty dumbed down view of the problem. For sure. But it's still a really important one. Yeah. There's a lot of North Stars here. Like, is it worth the time you save? Will it reduce the error rate? Mm -hmm. Do you want people to have assurance they did something right? Yep. Is a robot better at it? Right. Yeah. So uh, in, this, in this episode, our, our game plan is to talk about things here at Opula that we did that are easy wins. So like automation things that were like, oh my God, no brainer. So good that we did that. Things that are easy punts that we tried and we were like, oh my God, that was such a mistake or we decided not to do and we're very glad we didn't for automation. And then ones that were kind of on the fence and we're gonna go through those. But before we do, there's an important distinction to make of like an automation tool can be one of two things. It can be like a robot that you buy from the internet that does a thing for you. 
or it can be something that you make yourself, right? Which is also the tool project dichotomy. It's like, do you buy the example we'll talk about later is uh, Bobby, which is the uh, nickname we gave our cable cutting machine. You like put in a belt or a cable or tubing and you tell it cut 50 of this length and it just automatically cuts them for you. That $300 to buy that robot is like the best $300 we've ever spent. Sure. And we didn't have to build that thing. We just spent 300 bucks and it works great. I even tried building it. You, you might remember. Like I made like a, a CNC controlled guillotine on a treadmill. That was still when we were in my house. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I was like five hours into the build. It wasn't working. Yeah. I was like, okay, wait a sec. Yep. Is, does this exist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sometimes like just buying an off the shelf thing is the solve. Mm-hmm. And then other times there's, there are things that you literally can't buy. Like you cannot buy a machine to test the Lumen PNP feeder. <laughs> no, you have to build that. That doesn't exist. There's only one option. You have to make that yourself. So as we go through this, like some of these solutions are bought, some of them are built. It's always better to buy them if you can. Not always, but in many situations, it's better to buy them if you can. If you need the customization, you have to build it. Yeah. Sometimes you might even find that uh, something store bought does 80% of what you had wanted and like you're happy to leave that on the table mm-hmm. and just Hey, that's good enough. Or you mod it. Yeah. You know, like you can, you can edit certain things to do things a certain way. So yeah, th- there's options there, but like in terms of these tools, they could be built or bought, but, and that's just a money or time thing. You know, do you want to just put cash into it or do you want to try and design a robot to do it yourself? Well, you know, yeah. W- w- what's the unique value you're creating? Is it most of the time it's better to just buy a thing and move on with the stuff that's uniquely difficult. Let's get into the easy wins. Let's do it. We had some characteristics of what makes something an easy win. Mm-hmm. So like humans are accident prone. We can make mistakes. We can get hurt. Machines are robust. They're made out of metal. They're serious things that do things usually repetitively. Yeah. They're faster. Another thing about an easy win might be that you don't have a choice. Like it's an inevitable thing you need to automate. Yeah. Maybe you need that Lumen programmer <laughs> or the slot programmer. I mean. Yeah. 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 Like there's some things that you literally can't do manually and you need some kind of jig or fixture to do. Like we had to make a machine that programmed slots because like a human can't manually flip the bits in a <laughs> EEPROM. Like you need a thing to do that. So like easy wins are things where it's like the fact that a human is inconsistent or like there's a lot of little fiddly things that like a robot could be very consistent with. That's a great thing for building or buying an automation thing. Or obviously if you don't have a choice, <laughs> those, those, those are good easy wins. Yeah. The first real example we had was the, uh, the mobile Pogo pin jig. Yeah. Imperative thing. That was so important because when we did our first batch of a hundred machines or kits, we didn't have that jig. I was like 80% done with the code and <laughs> the jig was mostly built. I literally for every single one of those boards, I had a multimeter in continuity mode and I checked the continuity of the pin with the pin out for every single pin on that TQFP 100 to make sure it was connected to the peripherals for every one of those hundred boards. So like, it's like, I don't know, 10,000 continuity connections or something. If my orders of magnitude are right, that's, <laughs> that was a lot. So that one was like, okay, we absolutely have to make a jig for this. This is unsustainable. Yeah. And I remember you feeling shackled to like testing motherboards because it was a little bit too much to offload to like one of our like greenhorn techs. Right. I didn't want it to go to anybody else because it's a, such a you have to understand how it was designed a little bit to know like, oh, this pin needs to connect to this place and also this place, but not here very specifically not here. And I I didn't want to give it to anybody else. So So it's like to say to reduce the barriers to entry for like testing the quality of the motherboard, we had to make this pogo pin jig. We had a way to test it, but we needed something easier so that anyone could do it. Exactly. And I kind of think of that as like offloading my logic of what I'm checking for manually into a machine, like the lookup table in the mobile pogo jig that checks to see how are all these things connected properly that was put there by me that was my logic that now is instilled in a little worker bee in the jig that's doing all that for me so anyone can just borrow that little section of my brain to check you know that's what it feels like you know right and so if you notice that there's something that like requires an engineering thinking behind it that's a great opportunity to automate (laughs) oh yeah anytime you find yourself doing something tedious and consistently for the foreseeable future think of it heavily about automating it. Right. And foreseeable future is a good point we'll talk about later too. That also depends on a lot of stuff. <laughs> Another example kind of ironically is the Lumen. <laughs> oh yeah. You want to, you want to tell me about that? <laughs> <laughs> so we, I mean, this is the epitome of a project <laughs> because this is the whole point of the company, but like the pick and place that we make and sell, 
we use yeah. so that we don't have to manually assemble all of our circuit boards. It is a tool that we use to build everything that we make, all the feeder boards. Project for us, a tool for hopefully everyone listening. Exactly. exactly, And that's exactly it. We chose that to be the thing we take from project to tool yeah. as, as an organization. But that's another good example. Like That's a ton of work of fiddly component work that if we can automate to a computer that goes, I know what a properly aligned TQFP100 looks like. This is where I place it awesome that's a great thing to automate so the, the lumen is a really good example of this and just pick and place in general it's so handy compared right. to hand place yeah, yeah exactly like a pick and place is a is a good example of that is a fiddly problem that it's really inefficient for a human to do but a robot can do so fast and so precise yeah it's, it's removing over 500 decisions for you like this part the orientation of it is this the right place yep times however many parts it's yep. just you need it. It's solved yeah another really fun one we uh, lovingly call bobby yeah <laughs> we call him bobby because we're like he was our first employee yep. in a way because it's the robot. When, when Lucia and I were still, we were just starting out and we were, we were talking about like hiring a theoretical first employee and we were still in the garage and we were like, are we really going to ask Bobby to show up for work in my garage? And like, th- it was like the name we gave to the theoretical first person we would hire just as a colloquialism. And then when we bought the machine, we're like, okay, we're going to call this little guy Bobby because he was kind of our first employee making all these little belts. <laughs> yeah, Bobby's great. He's a great little machine. Such a good investment. Yeah. So for everyone listening, it's a $300 belt cutter from, I think, AliExpress. They mm-hmm. just, we only had to get one. Yeah. There's like five different lanes you can load material into and like a rubber wheel that pulls material in past a blade. Yep. And you can tell it how many times, how much distance you want it to go past the blade and how often you want the blade to cycle per increment of cut. Yeah. I have it cut vinyl tubing in 800 millimeter increments yep. and it hits the blade shing, shing, twice yep. <laughs> just to make sure it cut it. It's yeah. great. Yeah. And a GT2 timing belt. Yeah. And like all kinds of stuff. A whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. We, we run a bunch through it. We used to have it do the uh, FTP component tape. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was a little bit too inconsistent. We like to provide that to the customers with the, the, the pitch spacing cut in half. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. Like snipped right along the component hole and not yeah. over a component. Exactly. Yeah. And like you can't be that precise with like where it's going to line up with Bobby. Yeah. And like Bobby over like a 1.8 meter length of GT2 belt, it might vary 10 millimeters, but it's cheaper to have him cut a little bit extra than for us to just be cutting it by hand like we used to. Totally. Yep. <laughs> and we also inevitably put it into a jig that checks the length for like the not only like actually routing it through the gantries to see how long the GT2 belt is, but also the tubing goes into the jig for making the cable chain. So we check it after anyway. Yeah. It just it saves so much time to have this little guy that just does all that stuff for us. Yeah. We used to do it manually. It's just it's silly. Yeah. It's silly. It, it's something that you can automate so easily. So that was a huge win. We also have the ring light tester jig. So we, we make ring lights that go into the, the lumen as well. And it's literally just like a level shifter, a bunch of MLCCs and or some capacitors and a bunch of NeoPixels, WS2812 LEDs. All we need to do to make sure it works is send a little like Arduino Adafruit default NeoPixel strip test through it. So in 30 minutes, I soldered up a perf board with an Arduino 3D printed a little thing with some pogo pins and we have this little jig. It's like it's the size of a credit card and we put each ring light into it with the pogo pins going into the, the test points. We hit the reset button and it sends the data out to test the NeoPixels. It, it took me 30 minutes to make this and we've probably run like probably a few many thousands of yeah. ring lights through that single jig. <laughs> yeah. And you made it in like an hour and a half. And you never updated it. Yeah. No, I've never updated it. I've never touched it. <laughs> it's just it's just run. So that's another great example of like that's one where a human can't really test. You need to have something. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be crazy. We tested thousands of these things with something I made in. I think it was like printing time aside. I think it was like under an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And for a lot of these easy wins, you can have stopgap measures like assembly fixtures. That's something we'll talk about more in another episode. But yeah. you can get halfway to this really quick. Yeah. <laughs> yep. A hundred percent. So yeah, that ring light tester is a really good example of like quick, easy win, huge, huge value for being able to just test them really quick. The next one was Gundam. Yeah. So I'm going to let you explain. Yeah. Gundam is a, a piece <laughs> of software that I wrote that is our like uh, testing software suite. So it's a Python app it has a little GUI and you open it up, you select a test that are defined with a JSON file. And based on whatever's in that JSON file, it will run a whole bunch of tests on whatever it's connected to. Typically, there's a motherboard connected to the computer running Gundam, and the motherboard is like doing the controls. But Gundam does a bunch of stuff. We have it test every motherboard. So we have a, a jig that we plug every actuator into every motherboard once all the through hole and everything is soldered. And Gundam runs through a test where it's like, Move the x-axis, move the y-axis, home the x-axis, home the y-axis. It, like, it just goes through literally everything. Check the vacuum sensor. We do this whole test where we turn on all the pneumatics 
and we have someone cover their finger over a nozzle with an 045 tip. It's seriously cool. It's really cool. And it it goes through and like prompts you to do all this testing and make sure that the vacuum sensors are reading the right values and that there's enough of a difference between on and off of a part that it's a valid pick and you could detect it and all that kind of stuff. So we do a lot of that. We could do that manually. We could plug a motherboard into a computer and like be like, okay, G zero X 400. And we see, does it move the X axis? Or we just have a computer automate all of that. And it's just so much more worth automating. And we also have it log the data to a database. We take every result of every test with every serial number of everything we've ever tested and we log it so we can look it up later. We can see if a motherboard had to go through three rounds of testing or whatever. And we do the same thing with feeders too. Like we run this test on every feeder where we put tape into it. And we have it feed one component at a time. And there's actually a camera. Gundam has support for like printing to receipt printers and camera and machine vision is all baked into it as well. And it will find the void in the tape and it will make sure that the position of the tape is within tolerance for picking a 402 for every feeder. And we don't ship a feeder that hasn't gone through this test. So I was actually, I was on a trip shortly before we launched feeders. Yeah. And I had finished this test and y'all were running this test while I was gone. And it was, it was just like I was talking about before the MOBO testing, Jake. It was like there was a little... I had removed a chunk of my brain and put it into this machine so I could still pass judgment on feeders while I was gone. And Steven was nervous about not being there for the first week of like mass production for feeders. And like you were terrified of one being packed without having seen it. And I I said to you, I was like, Steven, what (laughs) about this feeder have you not signed off on? You controlled the full test suite on the computer. Yeah. Even though I wasn't there. I was a wreck that week. That was (laughs) was one of the worst weeks ever. It was horrible. But once I came back, I QC to literally every single one and we shipped them th- that next day, I think. But yeah, that, that, was, that was a lot. But yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it was for. It was taking an engineering decision of like, is this tape position within tolerance? Sucking it out of my brain and putting it into something that anyone can come in and run. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the exact kind of thing that you want to do is offload those engineering decisions that you don't want to spend all the time doing. But if you can hire someone to come in and have a robot make those decisions on your behalf, that's a great, great thing to automate. And it makes the people on the line feel great because they have more assurance that they're doing the right thing. No one wants to make mistakes. No one wants to build something bad. No one wants to ship something bad to a customer. Let these robots gatekeep bad products. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It's great. A robot will never be like, oh, it was kind of close. Maybe I'll let it go. It's like, no, it fails. It's like it it was, you know, 10 microns over. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. It's kind of okay, but it, and it tried really hard. Yeah, so no. but it's like, no, yeah. it's, it's, it's a fail. It, it's great. That's the way they QC should be. Yep. So yeah, we, we've done a lot of, a lot of things like that uh, with Gundam. So make it building out a tool like that. Now, if we need to add a new test, I make a new JSON file. I make a new subclass of the subtest class. <laughs> I even have a template version of it. So it's really easy to just make a new test, drop in some G code. It has support for cameras. It has support for receipt printing, everything. It's so easy to make a new test now. So that was good. Are you willing to go on the record and say it will be available for public uh, viewing soon? I would like to. Right now, I, there's a lot of like private keys for how we log stuff. So if I can package it into a format that anyone could pull it down and use it as a framework for testing, I love to do that because we would not operate without Gundam. Gundam is like the beating heart of QC here. Other people should be able to have it. So yeah, I'll, I, I'd like to package it up in a way. I just need to figure out how, because right now it's just this big repo that I pull down a, a Python script. We run it with like a script that runs a virtual environment and runs a Python script. Like it's not elegant. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I could see packaging it in some way that we could distribute it without like all our private keys for database logging and all that crap is available because we, obviously we can't share that. Yeah. But yeah, that would be really cool. I, I'd, I'd love, love to, to I'd love to see it out there. One day. Soon. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Yeah. I have, I have zero qualms with that. Theoretically, I think it would be awesome to do. Yeah. It's worth saying here, anytime we build a jig, it's almost a, a point to like get in and get out as fast as we can. It's not something we refine to the point of it's like saleable. Yeah, it's to perform the task and that's it. There's, there doesn't have to be as much documentation. Like we're still small. If we were a really big organization, it's worth spending that time because if someone else takes over for that jig, you need to have something written down about how it operates. But it's either going to be you or me, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and I can call you and be like, Lucian, what the hell do you do with this thing? And then you're like, oh, I did this and it, it, we don't need it. So there's a way different level of polish on jigs. Yeah. And that's just at our scale. At Formlabs, yeah. a way different story. A jig wasn't considered done unless there was assembly instructions for it, debugging instructions, maintenance instructions. Yeah. It was its like, own product. And like a bomb published. Yeah. Um, it was as documented as anything we had sold there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Bunny Huang has a great article series about making a test fixture. And one of my favorite lines is like, when you make a product, you actually make two products. You make the product and you make the product that tests the product or something along those lines. And it's, it's so true. 
Yeah. Many know? times the test equipment can be more complicated than the product. Yeah. Yeah. The motherboard and the motherboard mobile pogo testing jig, that is absolutely the case. <laughs> <laughs> the motherboard is an STM32 running Marlin with a bunch of peripherals. The pogo pin testing jig <laughs> Way is more. A, it is a R- Rube Goldberg of wires and software. I mean, it's it's not simple. <laughs> it should be though. I, I want to redo it. We'll get there. Yeah, we will. This also reminds me of like Easy Wins. Makes me think about this guy by the name of Taylor at Form Labs, who was on your team. He's on the manufacturing mm-hmm. team, and he, my management. He hired me. He was part of the interview. He wasn't the one who hired me, but I I interviewed with him when I interviewed yeah. at Form Labs. He said, "How would you test to see if like." this certain thing lines up with this other thing. This, this profile lines up with this other profile. And I was like, well, I would get a raspberry Pi and I get, you know, open CV and I'd install it on it. And I put it on there and he goes, how long do you think that would take? I'm like, I don't know. I think if I stayed up all night and mobile, I could do it in like two and a half days. I could get it working pretty well. And he goes, what if you just laser cut a piece of red acrylic that would show if it wasn't the right size and a green acrylic, if it showed that it was the correct size. He was like, Oh, and oh. I was like, oh, <laughs> duh. Like that, it's called the go, no go jig. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that would be so much better and so cheap. And I could do it in like 20 minutes instead of two and a half days and it would be finicky. And so that's another thing to think about with these easy wins. Like if you're leaning towards, oh, I need to do machine vision. It's like, do you, do you have to do this big, crazy thing? An easy win might be you laser cut a shape. Yeah. And that's enough. And that, that's a totally valid way to do Q. That's how QC happens on a million products. Yeah. So like be your own devil's advocate. Yeah. That can guess yourself. Like yeah. if you need machine vision, like be sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> there should be no other way. Like it's hard to not get nerd sniped of like, oh man, I want to build a thing about this. Do you really like, do you really have to build that? If you do great, do it, have fun with it. But if you don't be pragmatic about it, you're building this jig to save time. And like, it's really hard to not be like, oh, I want to do it just because it's fun. You really got to think about that trade off to be to be efficient in what you're making. And if you want to do it for fun on the weekends or, you know, whatever, whatever, do your own thing. But if you want to <laughs> save time, it's, it's hard to catch yourself on that kind of thing. Yeah. Like we found ourselves really worried about like the theaters having the wrong sticker on it. Yeah. So we're like, OK, should there be a camera that looks at the side of a theater and <laughs> uses OCR to read the stickers text? And it's like, well, be nice, but the OQC checklist can just say inspect sticker exactly and we have a little jig that checks the fiducial that like we can make sure there's literally a qc checklist thing of like make sure the fiducial check checks the sticker Mm -hmm. and like it matches up that's a way easier way to do it and which leads us great into easy punts so everything we just talked about are like easy wins for automation or doing something to try and get some automation equipment build some automation equipment but then there's things where it's like it doesn't make sense to do it like doing it manually or finding another way is usually the case yeah, and we've learned this kind of the hard way a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Generally, it can kind of come down to like, if your vendor can do it for just a little bit more, or maybe even it's free, just have them customize something in a certain way. Yeah. Probably just do that. Yep. Like as an example, I, and there's a video about this, I built this crazy analog belt winding jig that would take belt I'd cut to length previously, wind it up into a bundle, and then like shoot it off of an ejector platen <laughs> so that we could carefully pick it up, stack two wound windings to top each other before putting it in a two inch by three inch bag. <laughs> Whew, it was and a lot, right? It was a lot. And to be fair, it was the coolest jig, but it was a lot. Yeah. For one little step. And then get this, the I just asked the belt fender if we could have the belt come in five meter sections instead of fifty meter sections, and they said, Okay, dear. No problem. And then didn't they start bagging it for us too? Yeah. Same price. At no extra cost. So that was one where it was like, ah. Oh. I was nauseous thinking about how much time we had spent like winding those belts. Yep. And, and designing the jig, doing it manually. There's a lot of things that your vendor will happily do for you or you can get outsourced. Like bolt packing is another yeah. great example of this. We were going to manually pack bolts and we're like, ah, oh, well, let's buy a machine. And you found a crazy one, right? Yeah. Ryan was talking to us about it in one of the last episodes. Yeah, yeah. You can get a machine that will put any quantity of a fastener into a heat sealed bag for about 1100 bucks. But we had a hardware kit bag that had 17 different types of fasteners in it. <laughs> so, okay. I'd even gotten a quote for a machine that would integrate all of this together. It was like 14K all said and done for a machine that would take 17 hoppers and dispense requisite amounts of each thing into a heat sealed bag. <laughs> but, my God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And... So there's two things here. First of all, you ask the vendor and you're like, can you do it? And they're like, yeah, for like a (laughs) dollar extra per or two dollars extra per bag or something like that. No problem. Because they already bought that machine. They're just amortizing out the cost of that machine that they bought into bagging it already. So it's like tool or project. Do we really want to become a bolt bagger? Is that a thing we really want to 
no. become experts in gray beards? No, we don't. We want to just have the bagged thing. We don't want to have to think about that. We want to black box that if we can. So if we ask the vendor, hey, two more bucks, you do it, bet. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, after we were doing that, how much longer did we have that bolt bag? Like another oh. three months, maybe? <laughs> Till the end of BYOP. So like a couple hundred more machines. Right. So like it would have been worth it to buy the belt bagging robot if we had 14,000 bolt kit bags to make. Right. But we, we did not. We not just, even close. Not even close. Yeah. We had like 300. Yeah. There weren't many BYOPs yeah. all said and done. Yeah. So maybe it would have been worth if we imagined a product roadmap with bagged hardware for the foreseeable future. And in many ways, we still do have bagged hardware, but not to the extent that required a $14,000 machine that could make 17 unique parts in a bag. Exactly. That's not what we are going to have to do moving forward indefinitely. Looking back at the easy wins, Gundam, a, a piece of software I've spent tens if not hundreds of hours working on and tuning and tweaking and whatever, we will use that until the end of time. Like, Opula will always need some kind of testing solution, always. Testing motherboards, we will always make a motherboard, we'll always make a ring light. Like, those things are non-negotiable. They're easy to invest time in because we know they're not going to be deprecated. But bagging bolt bags, well, if we're starting to assemble stuff, who knows if we change the amount? And Like, maybe we don't need a big crazy machine. Your hackles should go up when you're thinking about, oh, this might be deprecated. Punt. Maybe it's worth doing manually or having a vendor do it instead. Yeah, the counter to this, though, it's important to say. When we were doing BYOP, we had to glue all the foam together. We had to, like, mask certain regions of foam from not getting spray glue on it. Right, but yeah. we also had to have uh, confidence that certain regions did have glue so the sheets could be laminated and parts couldn't slip between two laminated sheets. Yeah. So I had this crazy jig I had built to spray foam with glue and mask it in certain regions. Yeah. And, uh... We knew that it wouldn't have BYOP forever, but we still had to do it. True. So sometimes it's worth making a jig that has an expiration date. Right. Yep. And, and then how you choose to make that jig is different. Like when, when you would rebuy, because th- those uh, stencils would get really crappy and covered in spray glue. <laughs> when you would rebuy them, like you were playing around with like, what if we get them cut in aluminum and clean them off? And then we were like, oh, we're going to release a version that we don't pack it in the same packaging. You just started getting them in like cardboard or um you would, wouldn't you like laser cut them or get them in like mdf or like a different material a little different than how you described it okay they, the stencils started as laser cut ldpe they were miserable to cut on our machine right and then we switched to wood and that got gross and soggy yeah and we switched to aluminum thinking we could just clean them in a chemical vat That's and right. i'd i'd never found something that was not uh safe to do in the office right <laughs> so we just picked boogers off the stencils every now and then <laughs> <laughs> it was miserable. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you do have to do it. Sometimes you have to make a thing and you're like, yeah, this will be deprecated soon. I have no choice. I yep. have to do it. <laughs> we got to We got to make the donuts somehow, you know? Oh, yeah. There's a, a, another good example of this is in the Rev3 motherboard, we didn't have ferrite beads on the outputs of the stepper motor drivers for the motherboard. But then for Rev4, we added some capacitors and ferrite beads to help with like EMI, EMC stuff. And that is a whole component that the pogo pin test jig that we made for rev3 wasn't checking in rev4 so there were two options we either completely redo this wildly complicated pogo pin jig to check now for these ferrite beads (laughs) or which is what we actually do whoever's making motherboard sits down with a multimeter and checks continuity on the ferrite beads and it takes 15 seconds so sometimes it's like yeah this is a really ripe for automation is it worth it is it worth redoing this whole jig just to do that especially because we're thinking about how do we make a new version of the motherboard that's like almost all SMT so we can just populate everything with the lumen? If we're already know we're going to be redoing it anyway, yeah, we should just probe it with a multimeter. It's a good stopgap. It doesn't take that much time. We could automate it, but it's just, uh, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, the effort's better spent making the product better and SMT only. Exactly. So, you know, those are good, easy punts of like, it's going to be deprecated soon. It's something that you, you might not need. You don't know the future of it. Your vendor can do it pretty cheaply. Uh, yeah, it's just sometimes it's better to just do it manually. <laughs> As we say a lot, it's a balance. It's a balance. <laughs> Turns <laughs> out. <laughs> and you pretty good on that section. The next totally. one we had was stuff you were on the fence about where the jury's still out, the verdict's still out. It's debatable yeah. whether it was worth the time. Right. And sometimes these types of things are just, they were fun to mm-hmm. try. And it's, you're going to have some duds when you're shoot, trying to get a, a win. Totally. If we don't try the wrong thing every now and then, we, we wouldn't have known about Bobby. Exactly. And, and <laughs> we wouldn't have known that like, oh, a vendor will wind GT2 belt and cables for us. Like, oh, cool. We had to make a mistake to learn that thing, yeah. you know? So uh, a good example we have is the uh, 
I'm so excited about this thing, but it's been <laughs> sad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have an automated screwdriver gun. We call it a couple different things, but it's a torque limiting screwdriver that is connected to a screw hopper and some pneumatics that can load a screw onto the end of your screwdriver bit after you release the trigger. In reality, what you get is something that occasionally just decides to do whatever it wants. It occasionally <laughs> decides to ram the pneumatic mechanism into the thing you are fascinating. It occasionally <laughs> decides to not put a screw on the end of the tip. Yeah. And occasionally decides to lock itself into Chinese. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. It's, it's a little finicky. Yeah. But when it works, it really works. It's $1,500. Mm-hmm. The idea was that it was so useful. We have one per bolt type and we have five per station and it's just, it hasn't been that. Yeah. It, it, that's a great example of something that it has to kind of work perfectly for it to be a better solution. If every time you use it, you hold it and you drive it in, drive a screw, torque limit in that screw, release the button, it loads another screw, you do it again. If that happens every single time, that is faster than taking already a torque limiting, very easy screw gun and then just manually getting a screw. Yeah. It has to be perfect to be better than the manual solution. And those are the ones where it's kind of on the fence. Like, is it going to be perfect? Even if, if we have a tool that isn't like, like Bobby is off by plus or minus a few millimeters, it's still faster to be a little imperfect mm-hmm. and better. And then we just check in QC or whatever, and we make sure it's still fine. That's an easy win. But when it's like, oh, it has to be literally on point to make it worth it. That's where it's a little bit more on the fence. Yeah. And you want me to do a weird hack to it too. Like what, what what's the weird thing? Yeah. So weirdly, if, when you release the trigger, it's supposed to load a bolt, mm-hmm. but that's erratic. It doesn't work a lot of the time. Okay. But if you hit the touch screen on the machine and you hit cycle bolt, mm-hmm. it will 100% of the time perfectly consistently load a fastener. Okay. So there's something about the trigger that doesn't talk back to the machine okay. consistently. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So you want to like, you want to hack in something that touches that. Yeah. I, I basically need a foot pedal that makes a servo push a hot dog against the touch screen <laughs> like, or a conductive probe. <laughs> Touching the screen at the press of a foot pedal. Right. And you know what? Maybe, <laughs> maybe 30 minutes of me doing some jankery with a capacitive touch, but probably not a hot dog, but a capacitive touch probe or something on a servo makes this tool be faster than doing it manually. And I think it even make this machine safer than it otherwise was. Cause if I like that, the it's not timing based when the machine reloads the bolt, right? Your, your fingers are out of the way. You're ready for it to cycle the, the piston, right? You press the foot pedal. And then it puts the bolt on. Sure. Because right now, when you drive it in, as soon as you let go, it's going to put another one on instead of deciding when you want to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of decide with letting go. But if it's inconsistent, then it's like, is it going to do this pneumatic procedure? Yeah. Sometimes the piston just rams into the the slot PCB. Right. (laughs) Just like, I didn't ask you to do that. Exactly. Exactly. I don't want to harp on this poor thing. It's probably me not maintaining it in some way. Maybe. But, you know, well, well, that's one where, like, we already spent the money on it. It's worth some effort to get it working to make things faster. Yeah. And easier, like, more consistent. It, it checks all the boxes. We just got to get it there. Yeah. So that's a good example of it. I mentioned earlier we're looking to uprev the motherboard. Really nothing functionally different at all. It's really more about, like, converting all the connectors to surface mount and, like, making it a little bigger so it's easier to access some stuff. More just, like, making it easier for us to manufacture. And I want to replace the Pogo pin jig for the existing motherboard. But if we're already thinking about uprevving it, it's like, ah, oh, do I spend this time to make a new version of the <laughs> jig that's a little safer? The, uh, safer just in terms of like the one I made now is so finicky. Like if if a, com- a certain component's on backwards, it'll blow out the jig. Like it's, it's super fun. It's it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if I'm running it, it's always fine. But I have to run it, so I wanted to replace it. We were actually just talking about this yesterday, and you're yeah. like, dude, should you really be? doing that right now like we really should be just focusing on the new version of the motherboard and then make the jig for that and can we still make this jig work because it does work it's just when it doesn't it, it's a <laughs> 90 minute detour for me to fix it so yeah. that was a really good example of like i wasn't on the fence i wasn't seeing the whole picture and you're like dude no <laughs> this doesn't make sense to do right now we should wait for the new motherboard and do it then so your time's just better spent moving the needle forward on the, the next board exactly you know it's it's that's a really good way to put it so th- that's a big thing to think about too it's kind of in line with the other stuff. Is it going to be replaced soon? It might be frustrating now, but like maybe limping forward until the new thing comes out is the best course of action and not to spend, you know, 20 hours working on a jig that you're going to deprecate after it's used eight times. That sucks. You know, you got to be aware of that too. For sure. Yeah. We got, we got one more we were on the fence about. Yeah. Um, and it was the staging plate that the machine comes with has a knockout plate in the center. The machine has two staging plates, one where the plate has the knockout punched through and one where we don't because it's like 
uh, auxiliary. It's the secondary plate where you'd put PCBs. You don't need the hole for the camera there. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of tedious to punch out the the plate consistently, cleanly. Um, we had just switched over from metal ones that always had the hole yeah. punched out. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, this kind of sucks with the PCB, right? So let me just quickly make a fixture for a cheapy little CNC router to just cut out the center plate. Yeah. Put like eight hours into it, made fixtures and dowel pins to like hold it. And it just, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I'm on the fence about it. It was just bad. It would have worked with more effort, a better CNC. Yeah. But then we have a room filled with fiberglass dust. Exactly. Like if, if it was a matter of like someone puts a staging plate onto it and it just goes and it cuts it out, no problem. And it's a clean cut and no big deal. Sure. And there's a, there's a little, there's already a messy place for it. And there's a computer set up to run can G code and whatever. I think that's great. Yeah. But when it also only takes like, 30 seconds to cut that thing out with some snips anyway. Oh, it's like, it's such a small optimization. It would look a little cleaner, but it's like, uh, you yeah. know, it's probably not worth it. <laughs> and no one would, no one's ever complained about like, oh, you punched it out. Not well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not hard to make it look clean. It's, it's mouse bites. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fine. So that one was one where we were kind of on the fence about it. And like, after you got, you kind of understood the problem space having been eight hours deep, you're like, no, <laughs> yeah. this isn't going it, to, it's easier to just punch them out. <laughs> and now these days where we probably purchase staging plates at a quantity where we could just ask that half of our purchased staging plates don't have the right. punch out. Yeah. We give them two designs and we just have them make the other one. Yeah. You know, that, that's another way to think about it is, you know, can we offload it to the vendor? Can we have the vendor do this instead? Make a different version because they, can they punch out the existing version? Yeah. Usually they're down to clown. They're down to try weird stuff that you ask. Like they want to help, you know, they're a partner. Yeah, and if, even if they can't do it for free, they will always happily offer their labor at their markup. Yep. How it works. <laughs> yep, that's how it works. So that's how they make money. Yeah. it's Some of them are tricky, though. Some of them are really hard to figure out if it's worth it. I, I thought at first I was a little on the fence, and then as you were going through about the milling out the staging plate cutout, and then halfway through I was like, okay, this, this would be pretty sick. And then by the end of the eight hours, you're like, no. I was like, okay. <laughs> that was, it was a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. I'd seen what it would take to get that to the finish line and just said, I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, be willing to make sure you're on the right track. Make sure you're driving towards what you actually wanted. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> be willing to give up is great. There's a, there's a book by Seth Godin called The Dip. If y'all haven't heard of this book, I highly recommend it. It's very short. It's a very quick read because it's just one main point, which is whenever you're taking on a task, there's a big dip of like, wow, this is really hard and it sucks before you get the payoff of the fruits of your labor. And different projects have different dips. Going to med school has an insanely deep and long dip. But like (laughs) baking a cake has a dip of like 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, when you are tackling a project, understand what the dip is and what your cutoff is. And I had this with YouTube. I'm like, if YouTube isn't successful for me with my number was five years, Mm. if I go for five years and it doesn't bite, I'm going to switch my tactic. Mm. And that was what I allocated for my dip. And I decided after five years, I will quit. Quitting is good. Yeah. It means that if you're like, okay, this isn't worth it for me, you move on to something that is worth it. You know, it just depends on what your balance is, but highly recommend the book. It's really good. So you saw the dip, you saw how long the dip was and you're like, nah, we outie, we're doing something yeah, else. <laughs> back up. Yep. It's a, it's a good <laughs> thing to do. You know, sunk cost fallacy is exactly that. It's a fallacy. You're like, whatever. I spent eight hours on this, but I know it's going to be another 16 and it's still going to be finicky. Stop. Yeah. And that's <laughs> no. okay. Yeah. I don't mind going back to the flush cutters. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If someone buys a staging plate to build a lumen, there's so much more harder stuff than punching out that plate they're going to encounter along the way. Right. 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 <laughs> exactly. You mean a builder? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Soldering a motherboard is the thing. <laughs> Most people who buy a staging plate from us just need it for extra work holding. The exactly. camera's already there. So exactly. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a good point. Yeah. That's like the, the full range that for stuff that was top of mind for us. Mm-hmm. We probably missed a couple. And we left out the more analog jigs, like assembly fixtures yeah, to talk th- about later. Yeah, this is all kind of like about automation equipment, like buying tools that do things, the screw gun, bobby, the belt winding jig, that kind of stuff, or building them to do that kind of stuff. But like jigs and fixtures, I think we should do a whole episode about that yeah, later. Yeah, totally. It's just you going in about what materials and gd and and what surface are you controlling and, you know, how do you get them made? And there's a lot there. Another component to this too is like, I feel like there's the hardware side, like the robot side. Mm-hmm. And then like, there is a software side here too, like the data and how we use it. You mean like, like Gundam and logging the data? Yeah. Or like, that? yeah I mean, we kind of, we, we log all our data in a way that we can look at it mm-hmm. and that's it. 
And if we need to reference it, we have the ability to reference it and look at it and see what the sitch is in terms of like manufacturing and stuff. And that's kind of it. Like some, if we have to, especially in testing, Gundam has been really helpful for, you know, measuring Y variants in a certain feeder with a certain version of firmware. And I can actually check the standard deviation of Y positioning for a hundred tests run with a certain version of firmware versus another one. Mm. So it's really handy for like seeing, was there a regression in accuracy with this version of firmware? And like, we have the tools to do that because we set up all these systems. So automation in that way can just help you get answers quicker too. It's not even just about manufacturing, but like if you have some of these things set up, you can use it for engineering too. Right. Like I have a, I have a plot leveraging the Eater Gundam data that plots uh, Y axis variants over time. I just feel like our feeder is getting more accurate or less accurate as we make more of them. Yeah. And that's a great thing for you to be like, okay, was there, if there was a regression, we're failing more feeders. Why? What change? Was there a different batch of wheels? Was there a different, you know, we did a different technique. There's a different jig. It's just good to keep an eye on all that stuff. So automation equipment can also help you have more insight into what you're doing if it's smart and do cool things like print out a receipt when the motherboard <laughs> passes. <laughs> <laughs> you love that receipt. I love, I love the receipt printing. It's, it's so it's fun. It's more important than you'd think because it's tedious to have to like, okay, here's a motherboard with a serial number. Let me just go to the computer and see what its state is. Like, no, just binder clip a receipt to it. Yep. In the real world that we operate in, it's sometimes it's nice to have a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. It really is, you know, a traveler. Yeah. It's, it's great to have that. Uh, what other automation jigs? I think that's the meat of them. I can't really think of anything else that we use. Okay, I think that's it then. I can't yeah. think of anything else. I think that's that's all our notes, and it kind of covers everything we do in terms of equipment purchasing. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this one. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave a review where you get your podcasts. They really help us out. And you can find Opulo on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And please don't forget to check out opulo.io and sign up for our newsletter where we write blog posts and do customer interviews with other folks that build cool open hardware. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. Humans are little meatballs, and sometimes we're bad at stuff, so I'm not having fun reading this. Thing. <laughs> okay. I'm not having fun. Oh, fun. No. <laughs> I'm cutting. Okay. I'm backing up off you this exit ramp. You use the dip.